Father, thank you for another Sabbath day. Thank you for gathering us here again for sustaining us through another week, Lord. We just we just want to come together to praise you. We just want to come together to be near to you. We really need your presence, Lord. It seems that we're always in need of healing. And small or great, we're just it's just not always easy being in this world. It rarely is. But we just look forward to whatever's ahead, and, and often we don't really know what we need, but we just we pray that you take joy in this day, that we're here because you, you just told us to be. You told us to be here together at this time, your appointed time. And we thank you that we can know that you're near to us always, but that you're especially near today with us gathered because because this is where you told us to be, and this is the time you told us to be together. So, Father, we just ask that your presence would be thick here today. We're just weary from just being in this world, and we just want to be near to you because your presence is the place of change. So we pray that you would anoint this this day, this, this praise, that our hearts would just be filled with joy and that we don't have to think about anything other than what you would will today just so glad to be called your people. It's such a blessing, Lord, and we pray that you would you would be blessed today, that Jesus would walk among us here today, that you'd speak into our hearts what needs to, whether it's comfortable or not, whether it's pleasing, whatever, you know what's, you know, above, you know, above what we can even see, you know what we need, and we pray that you'd bless the messages and the discussions and just everything on this day, this holy day. We thank you so much for your sacrifice your continual sacrifice, Lord. We just thank you so much for that. Pray that you're blessed today in Jesus' name. Amen. Page number 16. Oh 
<laughs> Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. wanted to look a little bit at how we use the gift of speech that the Lord has blessed us with. It's a tremendous asset. It's a very powerful thing. And because of that, we have to be very careful about how we use it. You know, anything that the Lord has blessed us with, we want to be good stewards of. And there's, I mean, time would fail me to go through all the scriptures that the Lord preserve for us on how to use our speech and to watch over our tongue. And, but here in Ephesians chapter 4, notice verse 17. Paul says, This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in the understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, and because of the hardness of their heart. So, you know, Paul is using, that's what he's, he begins by saying, I'm saying this to you so that you can understand how it is that people are held in slavery because it's futility in their mind. They're not able to think properly. That's what deception does to you. Deception gets you thinking along something that is not real. And, you know, you then start to make decisions and you act upon something that isn't, that isn't true. the hardness of their heart, and they have become callous and have given, given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. You know, I was talking with Sandy this week, and he brought up something I'd never really thought about before in this way, but you know, we know that we use the word of God to, it's like... It's a mirror. It also washes us. It also strengthens our hearts. And there's many times where maybe we feel like we're not hearing from God. Maybe you're praying and you don't feel like you're hearing anything back for a season. You can hear from God through his word. You can pray his word and you can, and you can store those things up in your heart for those dry times by making sure that you are taking enough of it in. And that's, you know, essentially what Paul is saying here is you didn't learn Christ in a way that made you have a hardness of heart. The Word of God makes your heart pliable. It breaks down the callous, uh, you know, if you're doing it sincerely, if you're, if you're really honestly letting the truth be what it is. Uh, we have to think in that way. When we are coming to Jesus, you have to be humble in that way. Just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in, the, in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and you put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. So therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another." You know, you understand, as Paul is saying here, the things that you say, the, the, the choices that you make to voice, to actually use your speech, they affect you, and they affect the people that are around you. And they can have a, a really good effect. I remember Job, when he was going through his trials, he mentioned that to his friends friends who should have been able to encourage him. And he told them, you know, I could construct words the ways that you guys have. I could do that. Or I could, I could use my speech to lessen your pain and to actually make you stronger. You know, there's an, there's an admonition here that you're going to have to make a conscious effort to lay the falsehood aside. Because it's natural. It's just, it's your default if you want to look at it that way. And that has to be dealt with so that you can speak the truth. And you can say honestly what it is that you think. There's this idea that, that I think Jesus kind of personified in that you don't want to use that gift. You don't want to use the, your ability to speak 
as a means to get what you think you want. I, I, I remember when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he was saying that you had the keys and not only did you not enter, but you prevented other people from entering. And because they had this idea of what it is that they wanted, rather than just saying, Lord, let it be however it is that you want, which is, that was the prayer that Jesus prayed. And, it, and it's not divorced from the fact that he was feeling pressure to want to avoid it. He even prayed that, but he paired it with the, I, you know, it's the, the trust in that what has to be done, I'm willing to do. And I'm not going to try to use that gift that we have to get what I think I want. Because we all think that, you know, we've been there in that place where you thought, you, you were convinced that you wanted something. And then you find out later after you didn't receive it that it actually would have been really bad for you. And, you know, the Lord is a good father in that way. So notice verse 26. He says, be angry and yet do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. And there's a lot in that little admonition there, the instruction. But I think you want to be very careful and think about what you say before you say it. And think about the effect that it's going to have rather than just the emotions that you're feeling in order that, you know, that maybe are motivating you to say it. Because we're emotional creatures. God made us that way. And we're to use those as instruments. That's why he says, be angry. Don't act like you're not angry. Because you are angry. You're going to be angry on many instances because there's a lot of injustice and there's a lot of things that are aggravating in this life. So you be angry, but don't allow that to control you. Don't allow it to cause you to sin. And, you know, don't let the sun go down on your anger either. So, you know, acknowledge it and do what is necessary in order to put it to rest. And verse 27, when he says, do not give the devil an opportunity, you know, there's going to be lots of opportunities. There's going to be lots of reasons for you to have resentment towards your brethren that, going to come up because we all stumble in many ways, as James says. And when he was talking about those that are going to take up teaching, for instance, you know, don't let it be a whole lot of you because uh, we all stumble in many ways. And the devil uses that to his advantage to keep people in that futility of their mind where they can't really think properly. But what we can do is we can keep from adding to those opportunities. You don't want to create them. If you can uh, make it your habit to think before you speak, before you voice those things, and really meter it through against, you know, you can kind of filter it with God's Word. You can see, well, you know, that isn't really right. I don't actually see that as being anything that is going to help the situation. You know, I remember... finding some clarity on how it is that, you know, when you're operating in a group, you have to be able to hold each other accountable. You know, in a body, you know, you have to hold each other accountable. We need that. We need people holding us accountable because uh, that's a tremendous help to us. And so, you know, have people that really love you, they'll hold you accountable. That's different than blame. Blame is easy. Accountability is difficult. That's hard to do. You know, you have to, you have to use love and you have to be properly motivated and you have to really know the individual to be able to do that in a in a, a way that is sustainable notice verse 29 let no unwholesome, unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear you know it's interesting to think about how it is you could give grace to someone if you're saying the right things. And you're not going to do that if you're not taking in the right things. Jesus made that clear, you know, that it's the Pharisees were so caught up in... Well, we can read it. We can just turn to Matthew chapter 15. Verse 
chapter 15, verse 1. Some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And Jesus answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever shall say to his father or mother anything of mine that you might have been helped by has been given to God. He is not to honor his father or his mother, and thus you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Then he called the multitude to him, and he said, Hear and understand, not what enters into the mouth defiles the man. But what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. And you could tell, you know, that the Pharisees were in a situation where they were using their connection to God to get what they wanted, rather than to just try to strive to be useful to him and to honor him. And that's what Jesus was saying. It's like, you honor me with your lips, but that's, you're just doing that to try to get something. It's kind of like the situation that Cain was in. You know, Cain and Abel were both offering, and it's not evident that there's anything wrong with the offering itself of a substance, you know, because what the Lord said is that you've got to change your behavior. And when you do that, then you'll be accepted. And there's also quite a weighty thing that you can invalidate the word of God for the sake of tradition, you know, and what does that mean? It just means that you just make it where it doesn't have any effect, where it doesn't really mean anything. You know, you can you can, you can do that. You can, you can take that great gift that we have and you can make it where it is handicapped, that it's not able to have the, the effect that it was intended to have. And then these are people that they knew the word of God, but you know, they, they didn't take it and unite it with faith. That was the difference. You know, they, were, they were using it as a means rather than let it be the truth of who God is. Let's look at Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Verse 2, Paul says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God may open up a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned. You know, it's interesting to watch how it is that Jesus would speak to some people and not speak to others. You have to use some wisdom about it. It's not for everyone. That's why he's saying, "Is like, listen, pray that there would be a door open so that we have that opportunity, so that we can speak in the way that we should, so that we can speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned, in order that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to make clear what it is that you should believe. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity, and let your speech always be with grace, seasoned, as it were, with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. Using that, you know, as a means of grace. And back over to um, Ephesians chapter 4. We've gone over the scriptures in James where James is talking about how like the tongue is a very dangerous thing. It's, it's, it's able to be extremely destructive. But, you know, when it's under control, when, it, when, it's, when, it's, when you've been trained with it properly, that it is, it's an extremely effective weapon. 
here in Ephesians chapter 4, notice verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. You know, there's the the contrast there where it's you not letting all those things that are natural to the fleshly man to manifest themselves, but you're, you're striving uh, so that you can use your mouth as a means of edification for building up. And it doesn't always mean that you're saying nice things to each other. That, again, goes back to the accountability part. and You can just go through all the things that Jesus said. Sometimes things that seemed very harsh, but, you know, they were edifying. Of course they were edifying. So we let those things be put away from us along with all malice, verse 32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God and Christ also has forgiven you. Amen. Psalm 119, 17 through 32. Let me, your servant, walk in abundance of life, that I may always live to obey your truth. Open my eyes to see the miracle wonders hidden in your word. My life on earth is so brief, so tutor me in the ways of your wisdom. I am continually consumed by these irresistible longings, these cravings to obey your every commandment. Your displeasure rests with those who are arrogant, who think they know everything. You, rebu you rebuke the rebellious who re refuse your laws. <clears throat> Don't let them mock and scorn me for obeying you. For even if the princes and my leaders choose to criticize me, I will continue to serve you and walk in the plans for my life. Your commandments are my counselors. Your word is my light and my delight. Lord, I'm fading away. I'm discouraged and lying in the dust. Revive me by your word just like you promised you would. I've poured out my life before you, and you've always been there for me. So now I ask, teach me more of your holy decrees. Open up my understanding to the ways of your wisdom, and I will meditate deeply on your splendor and your wonders. My life's strength melts away with grief and sadness. Come strengthen me and encourage me with your words. Keep me far away from what is false. Give me grace to stay true to your laws. I've chosen to obey your truth and walk in the splendor light of all that you teach me. Lord, don't allow me to make a mess of my life, for I cling to your commands and follow them as closely as I can. I will run after you with delight in my heart, for you will make me obedient to your instructions. Amen.
Hallelujah. Yeah. But page number 29.
page number 39.
Praise the Lord, everybody. If you have any prayer requests that you'd like us to burn with our incense, write it down and we'll come and get it. You can bring it up here and put it in this bowl. Welcome all of you who are watching today and who may be seeing this at a later date. We, we wish you a happy Sabbath today and hope that you are in the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we do have special music today. Aubrey is going to sing The Garden, and Sarah is going to sing Let Your Glory Fill This House. Is that right? Let your, huh? Is that? Look, well, let your glory fill this place. Uh, she likes to correct people. Look at that. <laughs> let your glory fill this place. Um, Brian is having a um, evening of worship here at the church uh, Tuesday evening. Is that, uh, did you say 713? Okay, 713, because of Chronicles 1 through 3, Second Chronicles chapter 7, 1 through 3. Why don't somebody come up here and read that? David, you want to get that? Second Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. It's page 536. Yeah. <laughs> you got the right audience when you do that joke, because you know I like that. 7, 1 through 3. Okay. Now the sons of Issachar were four. Tola, Pua, Jashub, Am I getting the right thing? Oh, sorry. First Chronicles. Just bear with me. All right. Now, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. And all the sons of Israel seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house. They bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped, and they gave praise to the Lord, saying, Truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> My, wasn't it interesting how many times the Lord said, House. <laughs> Let your glory fill this house. In the original Hebrew, it's place. All right, okay, all right. So uh, everyone is invited, and it's uh, this Tuesday here in this place, in this place, Tuesday, at 7.13 p.m. Uh, I think most of you know that uh, Trion... His father um, got sick this week. Uh, she went up. Turns out that his gallbladder is bad, and he had a stone, maybe stones, because I think they removed more than one, um, that was lodged in his bile duct. And it was something that uh, uh, the hospital in Clarksville and Russville could not do that procedure. So it had to either be Fort Smith or Little Rock, and since he lives in Hartman, they went to Fort Smith. So uh, I think, uh, now that was, he had the stones removed yesterday, but he has to have gallbladder surgery today. And he's probably in surgery now. Uh, this morning, somewhere around nine o'clock, uh, they had already taken him back for preparation. So I don't know how long that uh, operation uh, takes, but anyway, keep him in your prayers, and uh, that God will intervene in his behalf, and good to see Jody here through all the pain. He feels better today. Um, okay, good. That's great. Um, Do we have any... We did, okay. All right, so um, 
what we'll do at this time is if you feel up to it, you feel up to it. We'll have Jody come up, pray over these prayer requests. And then before we have special music, we have a testimony that Stacia is going to give. I hope that we can have a testimony every, uh, every Sabbath in between testimony services. Um, so uh, Jody will come up, pray over these prayer requests. Uh, then Stacia will give her testimony, and then we'll have special music. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it's so wonderful to come before you, Lord, and just be here on your Sabbath day and to lift these prayer requests to you. Lord, we're, we're so thankful for your healing, and Lord, we ask that you just do your will in each and every one of these requests, Lord. We know that Jesus has paid such a high price for healing and for our forgiveness, so <clears throat> Lord, just do your will, and we thank you and praise you, and we await the outcome. In Jesus' name, amen. So I guess it was um, two weeks ago, Friday night service, and um, the Lord had spoken to Pastor and um, told him that he's he's emotional toward him, and it was beautiful words. And like he said, I know that we know that, and it it just was something kind of new at the moment. And um, uh, I guess I don't know why I I didn't really remember that through the week. Um, I think it might be one of those things where the Lord says it to him and maybe you think it's for him and not for you or something. But anyway, um, I went to work that week and I had been witnessing a little bit to a young man there. It started after the holidays. Um, we, you, know, he, you know how that happens. They say, do you have a good Christmas? And it always starts a conversation and praise the Lord for that. And... Um, and uh, so anyway, I came across this young man last week and had an opportunity again to witness, only this time um, it kind of changed. It had been more about, you know, doctrinal uh, things. He had questions um, about the holidays and things that I had brought up. But this time, um, I, it just was uh, different. I, was, it, we were standing in the hall at work. It was, you know, public place and um, but I just felt led differently in what I was saying, and I really can't even say all of what I said. I just know it was really sweet and beautiful, and um, I, uh, it was more, um, just more basic um, salvational uh, things and, and about the Lord, and um, I knew that he was kind of captivated by what I was saying, and I was as well. It was just, uh, and eventually I, I started getting, I started crying in the middle of the hallway. There was other people walking by, and I was a little bit embarrassed. And I was, you know, I thought at the time, I thought this is, um, I'm really emotional about this, you know, and and I'm not usually this way. And I, I even, I had a hard time. Um, telling him some things that I was trying to tell him and and uh because I was crying and I apologized to him that I was crying and so it kind of stood out to me uh at the time and I came home and I you know I was so I'm always it's always so um exciting to have the opportunity to know that you're you're a vessel you're being used by the Lord and in something that he's doing and so I, I shared it with Aubrey and again I was you know it stood out to me that I was emotional but I had forgotten about what he, the Lord had said, and uh, so when when Brian gave his sermonette last week, I came into my remembrance again, and then I realized, you know, that that was the Lord. It was like He was showing me, and He was telling me um, that was Him. It was I think the Lord used Brian in that sermonette just as a reminder to me to 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 remind me that He had said that, and um, that was Him, and. Um, so that uh, it's just um, 
it's just so much, it's just so meaningful to know that, uh, that we're used like that and it made it so much more meaningful to me. Um, when I think back on it now, you know, and I know that it wasn't me talking to that young man, it was his father. That was his father talking to him and he was emotional for him. He was wanting that young man to, to come to him and just so thankful um, to be a part of that. I just thank him today.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Just got word from uh, Treon's father. Went well. He's doing well. Praise God. Brethren, there's been a war on the truth since the very beginning. And that's what I'd like to talk about uh, tonight. Now, any observance, anything you do as far as part of worship, anything you believe, teachings, practice, if it has lies, if it's filled with lies or includes lies, it's the devil's fingerprints on it. Now, you know, when we talk about, you know, the war on the truth, where do we start? I mean, when you think about it, I mean, there's so many things. But just look at how the devil has hijacked what has been holy. First of all, God called the people to be holy. Uh, you know, they were in bondage in Egypt. And because of Abraham, because they were descend- descendants of a faithful man, God had chosen them to be a people, the first fruits of the nations. Now, God loves all the nations. We should put that straight up front. But there are first fruits. We're first fruits. You know, the church is first fruits. And Israel is the first fruits of the nations. Now, of course, we're above that because we're the first fruits of those who are born of God, uh, those who are ambassadors of the kingdom, the children of God, ambassadors in uh, the kingdom of God. So we're first fruits. But anything that God has made holy, the devil has tried to steal or kill or destroy. Now that's just what he has done. When we think about a holy people, he spent, uh, you know, he didn't, he didn't wait. He was immediately attacking them, trying to send false teachers in, trying to, well, first he sent the Egyptian army after them to try to uh, destroy them. And then he tried to corrupt them. And he did. He succeeded in corrupting them. And we read so many of these stories in the Old Testament of where he got the children of Israel to profane his word. And how many of you know God's word is holy? Amen. Thy word is holy. It's truth and it's holy. So the truth is holy. God's word is holy. His instruction is holy. And God gave Israel holy things. He gave them the reminded them of the holy Sabbath, which he gave Adam and Eve in the very beginning. It was, it was a part, it was the seventh day of creation. And God blessed it and made it holy that day. Now there will be people that say, well, there's no, there's no record of anyone keeping the Sabbath. Listen, we have record that God made the seventh day holy. He blessed it, sanctified it. That means he set it apart as holy, as for non-secular use, but for holy use. It was always holy, always holy, whether anyone ever kept it holy or not. But I believe faithful people, of course, did keep it holy. I believe Abel kept it holy. I believe Seth kept it holy and, and Enoch kept it holy. I believe those, those people and others kept it holy. Abraham kept it holy. Sarah kept it holy. And then he gave Israel, when he, he reminded Israel of this. And then when he made Israel a nation, he gave them holy appointed times. And he said, these are holy. These are holy days, not holidays, holy days. And so we see that the devil today has replaced the Sabbath with a secular work day. He's, he's been successful in doing that throughout most of what is known as Christianity. Now, he's also stolen away the holy days of God. Now, we keep the Sabbath and we keep the annual holy days of God, but isn't it interesting that when you find Christians out here who who will tell you that they believe in the Word of God, that they don't don't keep the holy appointed Sabbath day, which God said by a commandment written by His own finger into a tablet of stone, remember 
the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then he tells us why. For in six days, the Lord your God made all things, the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. He's just saying, do what I did. Do all your work on the first six days and you enter into my rest. Now we find in Hebrews chapter four that when we enter into the Sabbath rest, we're entering into the same rest that God entered into. We're joining him. And that was by his design. He, you know, why do you think he rested? Why do you think he set the seventh day apart? Why did he make it holy? Well, we find out later that when he came, called the people to be a holy people, he said, you shall have a holy convocation on the seventh day, for it is holy. You come before me every seventh day, for it is holy. And I'll meet you there. We're not doing anything else. He's not doing anything else. That's a divine appointment. And we see that in Leviticus chapter 23. These are the appointed times of the Lord, which you shall keep and proclaim each in their season. You can't proclaim the Sabbath out of its season. You can't proclaim the Sabbath on the first day or make up a philosophical argument and say, well, it's actually a new beginning. It's the eighth day. Well, that's ridiculous. That's just... Uh, that's just philosophical argument to do away with something that God says is holy. Now, there's no doubt the Sabbath is holy. Jesus kept the Sabbath. The apostles kept the Sabbath. We find in the book of Acts that when Peter is at Philippi, not Peter, but Paul is at Philippi with, with Silas to preach the gospel, they went down by the river on the Sabbath trying to find a place to rest and pray. Now, obviously, they were still keeping the Sabbath. So Paul did not receive or miss the memo that Jesus said, you don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore, you keep Sunday. So we have all those things, that the holy days of God have been replaced by the holidays of men, which have the fingerprints of the devil all over them. They have pagan customs all over them, Easter eggs and bunnies and sunrise services, hot cross buns, which the children of Israel uh, blasphemed God, blasphemed the word of God by doing that, making cakes for the queen of heaven. That's all that is, and that's how it got into Easter. Easter is uh, uh, an Egyptian uh, sex goddess, and they made cakes for they still today make hot cross buns. But where did it begin? We read about it in Ezekiel, that they made cakes for the queen of heaven. And a cake at that time is not like the cake I kind of like, which is sweet. It's just meant something baked, like bread or a biscuit or something like that. So we see that very clearly. And then there's people who say, we're going to honor the, the birthday of Jesus, so I know, well, how should we do it? I know. Let's go out and get an evergreen tree and drag it in the house, decorate it up, put, put gifts at his feet. And then we can put some mistletoe up, and, you know, if we catch one of the women under it, we can go smooch them. How about that? Hang our socks on the mantle. Oh, that's, that's, that's real sanitizing. I mean, that, that sounds good. I, I want to hang my socks on the mantle. Who knows? Maybe some little old jolly elf will come in and put some candy or something in there. You know, I hope it's something that's wrapped. I don't want to dig something out of my sock and eat it that, that it's not already wrapped. Wrap it up, Santa, or whatever. But think about those. We're going to burn the Yule log. These things have the devil's fingerprints on it. And the Apostle Paul said, don't do the things that the pagans did when they worshiped their God. Paul said that in the New Testament, in Corinthians. He said, you can't sit at the table of the Lord and the table of demons. And he said, what they did, they thought they were worshiping other gods, but they were really worshiping demons. They were sacrificing and celebrating, observing the worship of demons, masquerading as a deity. And that's what they've all done. So that's, but we see those things. There's no way that we can walk in truth and be children of truth. There's no way that the Holy Spirit of truth is going to lead you into those practices, which very clearly God has always found an abomination and has condemned those practices. He told the children of Israel, don't add, don't take away from what I command you. Don't add and don't take away from it. That is in worship. And then he tells them in chapter 12 of Deuteronomy, when you go into the land, 
And you see how the nations serve their gods. Don't you serve me the way they serve their gods. Well, how do they serve their gods? Well, they drag uh, an evergreen tree in during the winter solstice, during the Saturnalia. They had bonfires. They put up mistletoe. They, 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 uh, you know, celebrated uh, the, 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 the sun and the, the sun coming back. They tried to strengthen the sun because they believed that the sun was God. How did the uh, Egyptians or the Babylonians, the Babylonians believe that the whole creation was, came out from a giant egg that fell out of the sky? You know, and creation came from that giant egg. And where do you get that? Where do you get a bunny laying eggs? Come on. I mean, you know, it's Easter's bunny. Her bunny. It's her rabbit. Fertility. Eggs. So those things are very, very pagan. I mean, we don't even, do we even need to talk about Valentine's Day? That's obviously pagan. It's a Lupercalia is all that is. And then Halloween, I mean, that's obvious. Even a lot of Christians, so-called Christians, or Christian by name only, don't even want to have anything to do with Halloween. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. I mean, we can, when you were talking about the war on truth, we could talk about a lot of things. And believe me, you know how long-winded I am. And I, I thought, well, I'll take three things. And then I thought, I know how long-winded I am. And I know how oftentimes uh, that, you know, uh, I don't even get to read all the scriptures. I have to just get at the end and say, okay, now here's the rest of the scriptures, you guys. And y'all can look them up yourself. Now, to prove that I'm long-winded, I'm telling you I'm long-winded. And I don't have in my notes all that stuff about what I just said, the Christmas and the Sabbath and all that kind of stuff, but I was led by the Spirit to say it, amen, so I'm trusting God in that. And I assume that that's because of, since you guys already know that, that's for people who are watching and who's going to watch this sermon at a later date. So there has always been a war on the truth. I'm just going to go over these points, uh, and then we'll go through them. But I, I think that I'll just tell you what I want to, you know, bring up. There's been a war on the truth ever since the beginning. You know, Satan told Eve she wouldn't die. She could sin and not die. Any observance or doctrines that has lies or filled with lies has the devil's fingerprints on it. It's his work. It's his building. It's his stronghold. It does not come from God, and it cannot be holy. Today we'll look at how he has distorted the gospel. We're going to start with the gospel. How he has distorted the gospel. And how he has devalued the covenant of grace through faith by planting the lie that you are an immortal soul living in a fleshly body. Now that may seem harmless. It's not harmless. And when we think about the gospel... We might think about, well, false gospels. Well, you know, there's people of my background reduce the gospel to a future kingdom, which we call the millennial reign of Christ. And they'll say, well, it's not the gospel about Jesus. It's the gospel of Jesus. I just say to my friends there, you're not understanding the full meaning of the kingdom. We're transferred into the kingdom now. We're ambassadors of, of the kingdom right now. We're children of the kingdom right now when we receive Christ and are baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. That does not mean that there will not be a kingdom established on the earth where we will rule as kings and priests with the Lord Jesus Christ at his return. That's going to happen. But that gospel saves not one soul. That gospel does not have the power of salvation to those who believe. That gospel does not wash away anyone's sins. That gospel doesn't even give you eternal life. So that is not the pinnacle of the gospel. And if you want to know what the gospel is, look through the New Testament and see what the apostles of Jesus Christ actually taught. What did Peter teach in Acts chapter 2? Did he say anything about a gospel of a future kingdom government set up on this earth? He knew that would happen, but he also knew that wasn't the point of the gospel. You will not find it anywhere. And I want to make one observation right here that I trust that you have not thought about because I haven't thought about it and I'm not taught it. It just occurred to me. Last week, and I was going to preach about it last week, but I had a stomach virus that Saturday morning. But when you look through Acts, 
That's where you see the gospel preached. Jesus, Matthew chapter 28, told his disciples, I'm sending you to all the world. Preach this gospel, preach this gospel, baptize those who believe, and then teach them all that I taught you. And they did. And we see that beginning in the book of Acts, right? We see it happening for the first time on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up and he preached and 3,000 souls were saved that day. What saved them? What saved them was the gospel message. They responded to the gospel message. Look and see what the gospel message was. Look throughout the entire book of Acts. You'll see 10 places plainly where the gospel is preached. And I want to tell you, tell you that the spearhead of the gospel preached in Acts is the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day. They did not come and say, Jesus died for your sins, you need to repent. That was not said. What was said at the very beginning, the spear point was, Jesus was crucified. He was buried and he came out of that grave on the third day. Now that right there was controversial. Oh, that was controversial. The Greeks thought that was the most foolish thing they'd ever heard. You see, that was controversial. But listen, unless that is true, are you going to listen to any message about a man who, was, who came and taught some stuff and died? And you're supposed to believe that he has the power to forgive you your sins. He's still in the grave. Or maybe he mystically resurrected. Why did he have to be uh, risen in bodily form? Think about it. It's easy to say, well, he just went on. His spirit just went on. But he died and, and, and for, you, for, for your sins to be forgiven. And you have eternal life. No, no. The fact that he was on that grave and he was resurrected in bodily form. He had the scars. He ate. Now, he had supernatural power. He could walk right through a wall, but you could feel him. You could touch him. You could hug him. Amen. You see, he was real. His body was real, even though he had the supernatural ability to, to go right through a wall or just to appear or to just disappear. He had the ability to do that, but he had the ability to make his fleshly, human, resurrected body do that. Now, without that, and I, I submit to you, that that needs to be the spear point of the gospel. Because without that, I mean, a lot of people think, well, I don't need forgiveness. Listen, you need eternal life. This man came and he said, death can't hold me. And if you believe in me, though you die, you shall live. And I'm going to prove it. I'm going to die. I'm going to be dead three days and I'm coming back up. And just as death can't hold me, death can't hold anyone who believes in me. That's the spear point of the gospel. And when you read through Acts, and I encourage you to do it, each one of those places, you're going to find that's the first thing that is said and established before anyone could even believe that that same person has the power to forgive them of their sins. You see the difference? That's what was needed. And so that was the spear point of the gospel. Now, with that in mind and knowing that Part of the gospel is this, and we'll see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul plainly said what the gospel was. He said, I'm telling you, I'm reminding you what the gospel is. This is what we preach. And then he went on and he said that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was resurrected when? On the third day. Now we can talk about a gospel of a, you know, leaving out those are focusing on a, a future coming kingdom or a millennium. We can talk about that being an incomplete or really a false gospel narrative because that doesn't save anyone. That's not the saving part of the gospel. That's not the gospel for today. That's looking ahead. That's why you have the world ahead, beyond tomorrow. The world tomorrow. Well, listen. You're saved today. You're being saved today. And you shall be saved if you endure until the end. 
but we are saved. We are now seated in heavenly places. Amen. Now we can talk about the, the false gospel in Galatians where uh, Judaizers were coming along and adding the whole law of Moses. And we can talk about how that was separating people from Christ. And that's true. We can talk about how people were preaching, uh, teaching uh, and preaching uh, lawlessness. That is grace alone. And Paul said in Romans chapter 3, we're slanderously reported as preaching. Sin all you want to, but that grace may abound. You know, he said, may it never be. Shall we continue in sin? He goes on in chapter 6 of Romans. He said, no, how can we continue in sin if we've been saved from sin? Those are false gospels. There was the Gnostic false gospel that we see. Those are the three things we see in the New Testament. Adding the whole law of Moses, Judaizing, uh, taking away the commandments of God and licentiousness and lawlessness, and then the Gnostics gospels, which were just basic uh, pagan Greek ph philosophy, you know, just rank paganism that didn't even believe that Jesus came in the flesh. But there's something that today is a false gospel that is preached by almost everybody out here. And that is that Jesus came, that he died for your sins and mine, that he was buried, and that he was resurrected a day and a half later. We believe in a Messiah that does not fulfill the only sign that he gave that he was the Messiah. The sign of Jonah. Now that's a very important thing. See, it's extremely important because if you don't preach Jesus died and was risen on the third day, he is not fulfilling his own prophecy about himself. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's not the gospel that the apostles preached. Now the, God, the apostles didn't always name the third day. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. But it was established that they preached that, the significance of it. So we want to talk about the necessity of the truth. There can be no freedom without truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And of course, we want to talk about, as we have been, how Satan has distorted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he has done it today with, with a false interpretation of the sign of Jonah. And you'll hear people say, well, in the Greek, it can be parts of days. Well, interesting enough, Jesus gave the sign of Jonah, which was written in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, is three days and three nights. He didn't say three days, just, he said three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. Not two days and one night. Or two nights and one day, whatever it happens to be. <clears throat> So all 10 times the gospel is preached in Acts, it begins with the resurrection. And then Satan planted a lie that man is an immortal spirit. Now this, 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 the very inheritance that we have in our covenant is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. To say that we are already eternal, to say that we have, a matter of fact, what do we find in, in 1 Timothy? that the Father alone has immortality. Now you say, well, what about Jesus? He's talking, Jesus died. Now Jesus is immortal, but Jesus became mortal that he may die. And then he was raised immortal again. The only being now in the entire existence of living things that possesses immortality. Let's just turn here. First Timothy because I, I want to explain that what First Timothy chapter 6, that the Greek word which says who alone possesses immortality, Athanasia is what it is. And it means he's, been, he's free from death. In other words, he has not experienced death. Jesus experienced death for you and I. He died for us. 
So this is, you can't use this to try, somehow show that Jesus is not immortal. Verse 13. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be dominion, be honor, and eternal dominion. Amen. So God alone possesses immortality. Amen. Now, we find, of course, in Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus was equal with uh, God. He was God, equal with God. We sign that also in John chapter 1. But he emptied himself, as we see in Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself of divinity in order to be made a man that he may share in our flesh and live a perfect life and die for our sins. So it's the Father alone has lived forever and never has been free from death. Jesus is eternal, he's immortal, but he has not been freed from tasting death. He tastes death for us, amen? And that's how we would explain that. Now, the goal of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the defeat of death. That's the goal. He who believes in me, though he dies, he shall live. I will build my church and the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, means the grave. The grave cannot hold you, shall not prevail over you. All right, now let's go to Romans chapter one. And we'll see the necessity of the truth. There can be no freedom without the truth. In Romans chapter one, beginning in verse 18, Paul says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We want to understand the necessity of truth. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen. Now see, we don't have eternal power. We don't have, we have a divine nature now because we're born again of God. We're born of the Holy Spirit. We're born in Christ Jesus. So we are what he is. But without that, we are simply mortals. Amen. Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the resurrection and says this perishable must put on imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. We are mortal without Christ. Now, you and I have already received the gift of the Holy Spirit. You and I have already received the earnest of eternal life. You and I have the life of Christ living in us. We have eternal life living in us. But you were not born an immortal spirit living in a fleshly body. Amen. In order to get there, you have to be born again. Like, Nic like Jesus told Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom unless you're born again. And then we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The perishable must put on imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. And then he says, then shall it be said, O death, where is your sting? Death has power over us until we receive Christ Jesus. And even then we die with him and we're resurrected with him when we're baptized. So the truth is important. You'll see a lot of places where it plainly distinguishes God as immortal or eternal, not us. We are in Christ. But before we received Christ, we were simply mortal beings. And those of you who are watching, if you haven't received Christ, if you don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, if you haven't been born again of the Spirit in Christ Jesus through repentance and through baptism and following him, you 
are simply mortal. You will be resurrected after you die. But if you're not in Christ, you will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is called the second death. So God, the wrath of God is revealed against those who suppress the truth. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. They professed to be wise, but they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And I know it breaks God's heart. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now let's turn over to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And we'll begin in verse 1. And again here we're just showing the necessity of truth itself. There can be no freedom without truth. There can be no salvation without truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the life. There you are. I am the life. You have to come to me to have life. You, you know, if you, you, you will find the truth in me. I am the resurrection to, to life. We find in verse 1, it says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life. Now, obviously, he's saying, you, you may have thought that you're an immortal spirit. You may have thought you're a spirit living in a body. But I'm telling you, we're proclaiming to you the eternal life that was in Christ Jesus. How? Well, he was crucified, and the grave couldn't hold him. He was resurrected. That is the proof which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Verse five, this is a message we have heard from him. And we announce to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Now see, that, that's, that's why I'm saying if you find observances, if you find doctrines, observances, teachings, practices, uh, where it's tainted, it's stained by the world or the, the lies, it's the devil's fingerprints all over it. Where you, you know, if you find any darkness at all, that's the devil, obviously. You see? It was interesting, you know, Brittany wrote... Uh, uh, Matt Walsh, uh, a blogger, you know, most of you probably know who he is, but he uh, wrote an article, he's a Christian blogger, he wrote an article um, basically saying that Christians shouldn't be involved in yoga, and uh, the reason why basically is because the roots of it is pagan. Well, Brittany wrote him and said, well, the same thing is true though. Why, why is it then that you would make a distinction between Yoga, you would separate that from the pagan practices of Christmas and Easter and Valentine's Day and, and Halloween. Now, you haven't heard from him yet, I guess. But hopefully, he, she wrote him privately, so she didn't put it on the feed. So hopefully, he'll think about those things. But a lot of them, they just they don't think about the hypocrisy that is there. You know, they'll boldly preach about some things while they're holding on to things that are not even biblical. Not just not biblical, but actually pagan. You know, now listen, if you can't make yoga Christian, say, yo, yeah, but yoga I do is Christian. You know, in his mind, I'd say, well, can you make it? He already said in the article, well, you can't make it. 
Because he says there's people that says, well, yeah, but see, we do it the Christian way. He was saying you can't do it the Christian way because its roots are pagan. Well, the same thing. You can't, then you can't make the Saturnalia the birth of Jesus and celebrate the birth of Jesus on the Saturnalia. And you can't make up a festival, the resurrection, on the wrong day anyway, on Sunday, when he was actually resurrected at the end of the Sabbath, the tomb found empty on Sunday. You can't make a case for that either when you got Easter egg sunrise services, you got on the wrong day, and you don't have the authority to make a festival anyway of the resurrection. Because God said, don't add or take away from it. So you, when you look at that, that's darkness. You see, you bring darkness in, you bring lies in, you bring pagan customs in. So it says, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie. That's just simply a lie. And do not practice the truth. So you, you, you can't practice the truth and practice a lie at the same time any more than you can stand in the light and be in the darkness or vice versa. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And if we, if we walk in the light, walk in the truth, then the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Now, he, there's a qualification there. Walking in the light, walking in truth, in fellowship with the Father and the Son, in order to ensure that our sins are forgiven or cleansed by God. Amen. Now let's go over to 2 John. Verse 1. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom, notice how many times it says truth, whom I love in the truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth. For the sake of the truth, which abides in us and will be with us forever. We can say, what is the truth of the gospel? Well, the truth of the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he was risen on the third day and his blood was shed to ratify a covenant by which our sins are removed. Even the record of our sins are removed. We're justified to where there's no record of any sin and we have in inherited eternal life in his kingdom. That's, that's what it is. What do you think Jesus means when he says, you know, if, if, you know, if you don't lose your life today, you know, if you give your life today, you'll have, if you lose your life today, you'll have your life tomorrow. You know, it is like lay down your life today for eternal life tomorrow. Lay down your temporal life in this grimy, slimy world for eternal life in a glorious kingdom. That's, that's, that's what it is. That's the offer. That's what he's saying. The other stuff is what made it possible. Death has no power. That's, that's the message. That the gospel defeats death. Death has no sting anymore. For when you are in Christ, you, are, you, are, you have the earnest of eternal life in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, grace and mercy and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth just as we have received commandment to do so from the Father. So you see how many times the truth is mentioned. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I'm writing to you a new commandment, but the one which you have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to the commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. That is the definition, the Bible's definition of love. Now there's attributes. There's, there's a fruits of love that we find, you know, in... in uh, in First Corinthians, uh, Galatians, First uh, Corinthians chapter thirteen, Galatians chapter five, fruits of the spirit, and he says you need to remember this for many deceivers have gone out into the world. So we remember that we don't want to, to you know, we need to understand the importance of truth. Now I'll go over to John, the Gospel of John, chapter four, and perhaps the most powerful scripture on the necessity of truth can be found here when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And we'll just jump in at verse 19. The woman said to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. 
Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. And there's a whole lot of people, they worship. They don't know what they worship. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but an hour is coming and now is, even then, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. It's a necessity. It's not like, uh, you know, you don't have a choice here. He says you must Jesus is saying, you cannot truly worship God. You can't honor God unless you're doing it in spirit and in truth. You're led by the spirit, by the spirit of truth. And you're, you're worshiping him in spirit and truth. So you can't worship God in lies. You can't worship God coloring Easter eggs. You can't <clears throat> worship God by hanging mistletoe or decorating a Christmas tree. It doesn't matter. It's even worse that you put the name of Jesus Christ on it. That's an abomination. It's worse that you do that. It's worse that you would look at that tree and say, that's Christ's tree. That tree is for the mass of Christ. I mean, that is just ridiculous. I'm decorating this tree. First of all, you're not doing it for Jesus anyway. But you're claiming you are to give some type of validity to it. You're just practicing something people have practiced for thousands of years because it's fun and it's a custom. And you grow up in a society that has that custom. Well, this society didn't always have that custom. Amen. At one time, it was against the law to celebrate Christmas in the United States of America. You know, the great preacher, Charles Hayden Spurgeon, Baptist minister, called the Prince of Preachers year, many years ago said that we have nothing to do with that observance. With the mass of Christ, it's pagan. So we have nothing. As Christians, we have nothing to do with it. Well, I'll, I say today, I bet it'd be hard to find a Baptist church in December that doesn't have a Christmas tree yet. It wasn't always that way. See, sin starts little, and a little leaven spreads, and leaven's a whole lump. Just a little bit. Oh, I think it'd be all right if we're doing it. We're not really doing it for that reason. You're still doing it. What reason are you doing it? That's what I've asked people. Well, then, why are you doing it? I asked one preacher once. I said, well, if you're not doing it, you know, for the same reason the pagans did, you're not bringing a tree. I just asked him, you've got a, your prominent place in your house and decorate? Yeah. I said, Why? Well, I'm not doing it for the same reason they did. I said, well, then why are you doing it? You know, he couldn't answer that. I said, I'd just like to know, why? Do you ever ask yourself why? I mean, just think. I asked him, I said, when you went out and got it, and you pulled, pulled it up, and you set it in a prominent place in your house, and you began decorating, and then put gifts at his feet, what were you thinking? I'm mean, really, I mean, just what were you thinking? But the truth is, they're not thinking. They're just doing whatever. They're just following the customs of people, their society, their culture around them that is doing. Well, we're called out of that. We're called out. We're a part of Jesus' culture, amen? Not Satan's culture. Now, let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We will see how Satan has distorted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen. That's what he wants to do, to distort, distort everything. But obviously... Chief on his list is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the background of, you know, Worldwide Church of God, the background that I was, uh, came out of, you know, about, uh, well, a long time ago, back in 1993, when we uh, started this church, I mean, uh, the gospel there was about the millennial reign of Christ. That was the gospel. And that's what they taught about. There was very little ever said about Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, they'd say Christ crucified is a false gospel. Herbert Armstrong, in his greatest book, according to him, The Mystery of the Ages, which I have a copy of, in there, 
part of the restoration that God used him as his apostle, end time apostle, was to uh, reestablish the true gospel. And then he literally said in that book that Christ crucified was a false gospel. Christ crucified and resurrected, crucified for our sins and resurrected to give us life is the point. That is the point. There's not going to be no need for any, my, any millennial reign. Who's going to reign with him? Those who've received the gospel, obviously. So here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, notice verse 3. Paul said, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now think about that. If the gospel is veiled, any part of the gospel, what happens to the people that don't have it and don't receive it? They are perishing. Far be it from us to veil any part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In whose case the God of this world has been blinded, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. The light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. Now that sounds like it's about Christ. Who is the image of God? Now I want you to think about that. Will we have a millennial reign? Of course we'll have a millennial reign. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And some take that to talk about, we got to announce a future kingdom that's many years off. Back at this time, it would have been 2,000 years off at least, you know, because it's been that long, you know, since Christ uh, established the church. That has the power to save no one even though we're going to reign with Christ in the millennial and in the, during the millennium. Galatians chapter 1. Another distortion of the gospel. Notice Satan tries to veil the gospel so that people would perish. He tries to blind their minds to the truth of the gospel of Christ the glory of Christ, the image of God. And he was declared the Son of God by the resurrection. That's what the Bible says in the book of Romans. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him, verse 6, who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. So it's very important that the gospel not be distorted or parts of the gospel not be veiled. That's all the devil has to do, distort it a little bit. How was he distorting it here? Well, we got to add the book of Moses, circumcision and the whole book of Moses. We know that by the council. It, Paul talks about the council in chapter 2, and we see what happened at the council in Acts chapter 15. And we know what James ruled. We also have what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where he told the Gentile converts that circumcision or uncircumcision means nothing, but what matters is keeping the whole keeping the commandments of God. Then in chapter 5 of Galatians says, if you receive circumcision, you're obligated to keep the whole law. In chapter 3, he identifies that as having uh, the laws added because of transgressions. All the laws that were added because of transgressions. He said, if you are circumcised and you're, you are obligated to keep the whole law of Moses, and in Christ, there's no benefit for you. You have been severed from Christ. You who seek to be justified by law. So that's very dangerous. The same apostles, though, preaches keeping the commandments, but not the whole law of Moses. And that's the difference. 
Uh, you know, we find that when he confronted Peter in chapter 2, where Peter was kind of staying aloof from the Gentile, uncircumcised Gentiles, because there was some, uh, some brethren from Jerusalem there, and they were, thought themselves as clean and superior, and the Gentiles were still unclean, even though they're washed by the blood, even though they've been baptized and received the Holy Spirit. And what we find in ver chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Paul says, when I saw that they were not straightforward notice about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that is Paul, in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like Gentiles and not like Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We have people today in the name of Hebrew roots and messianic, uh, you know, messianic movement try to live like Jews. Peter wouldn't recognize you. Paul wouldn't recognize you. Paul was saying, listen, when these, how is it that when, you, when these guys are not around, when these guys from Jerusalem are not around, swinging around their little tassels off their butt, and when these guys are not around, I, you can't tell the difference between you, Peter, and any of these Gentile converts. So how is it that you, being a Jew, who don't live like a Jew, try to compel these Gentiles, who are not Jews, to live like Jews? There are people doing that today. Oh, it's fun. Get out the shofar. I'm not against the shofar. We've got one. I'm not going to parade around the first five books of the Bible. I have all of them. Including the writings of Jesus Christ and his apostles. Including the book of Revelation written by Jesus Christ. Now let's go over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And I mentioned this was one of the ways that the gospel was distorted. Verse 8. Paul said, And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. In other words, they're saying, uh, the people that were saying this is, you're not keeping the whole law. And what you're really just saying is, we'll just go ahead and do evil. Go ahead and, you know, pray. You don't matter what you do. You just go ahead and just uh, live whatever you want. Grace will cover it. Paul's not saying that. In chapter 6, notice over here in chapter 6, verse 1, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? He said, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now, let's go over to Matthew chapter 12. Now, we're going to look at now the sign of Jonah. Now, the sign of Jonah is an essential part. You hear that? I said, it's essential. It's, it's a necessary. It's necessary part of the gospel. It's essential. Here in um, Matthew chapter 12, we'll begin in verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now they wanted a sign. And he answered and said to them, it's an evil and adulterous generation that craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah, notice, was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now there, if you notice in your Bible, if you're reading along, you see the capital letters there uh, where Jesus in chapter 40, that's because Jesus is quoting uh, the Old Testament. So he's quoting an Old Testament scripture. He's quoting a scripture that was written originally in Hebrew. Three days and three nights. So that's what he's fulfilling. He's fulfilling what was written there. Now let's go over to probably our most important passages, and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for today's message. One of the most powerful 
passages, chapters in the entire Bible. And we need to understand, of course, that if we do not accept the sign of Jonah and we hold to the fact or to the belief that, well, he could have been crucified on Friday and resurrected Sunday. Uh, Let's just look at that for a moment. Now, look, Jesus was not crucified on Friday. He was crucified on the Passover. The next day at sundown on the Passover, because he was taken off the cross uh, you know, he died about three, taken off around five o'clock when they got his body. They put him in the tomb and they didn't wrap him. They just put the, listen, I believe the shroud of Turin is the actual burial cloth of Jesus. I really do. Because they can't, for, for many reasons, I've seen so many things on it, but I believe it really is. And it makes perfect sense to me. Now, some critics will say, yeah, but they wrapped people. When they were, you know, Lazarus was wrapped. That's true. But they put Jesus in the tomb before they had a chance to anoint his body, right? That's why Mary Magdalene and women were going back early the first day to the tomb in order to prepare his body with spices. Obviously, when they would prepare his body with spices, that's when they would wrap him. So wouldn't it make sense that if you know that you're going to have to come back and wrap you know, to prepare that body, you would lay the shroud out, you'd lay him on it and just lay it over. And then when you come in, you'll take that off, you'll put his body, then you'll wrap him, of course. They wouldn't wrap him, they have to unwrap him again. Can you imagine unwrapping, you know, a a limp, heavy body? I mean, you know, you just wouldn't do that. Wouldn't make any sense at all. So I believe that 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 shroud is actually real. I mean, there's so many reasons why I believe it, but there's just certain things like uh, there's no painting, or they can't find any paint on it, but there's no paintings anywhere that you can see that are ancient that don't have the nail scars in the hands, and we know they didn't put nail scars in the hand. They put it in the wrist, and that's what shows on the Shroud of Turin. Everything is exactly like what was described in the Bible. And he was so distorted. The face was so distorted. He just did not look like a a man. Even the coins, you can see the coins. They discovered that recently with high-powered microscopes. The coins that were placed on his eyes date back to that date. So, you know, I believe it's real. Now, okay, so now here, let's, we'll begin in verse one. Very important, uh, 1 Corinthians. This is the gospel. And this is the same gospel that's preached throughout the entire New Testament. There is no place in the entire New Testament where the gospel of Jesus Christ is presented as the world tomorrow. Nowhere. Now you can make it up. Well, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not about Jesus Christ. Well, I think the apostles are who was entrusted to preach the gospel. Amen. They were the one that sent forth. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to make something out of that little sentence, out of of, the word of. We can simply look and see what they said, beginning with Peter in Acts chapter 2. Very simple. We can do that. And you will never find the gospel presented as anything other than Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected. There's not one place in the entire, from Acts to Revelation and beyond, the end of Revelation, that presents the gospel as some future established government on the earth. We believe that we're going to rule Christ on the earth. But that's not the gospel that was preached by the apostles. That's what I'm saying. And anybody with any sense ought to know that does not have any power to save you or to wash away your sins or to give you eternal life. Amen. So here in verse 1 of chapter uh, 15. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you which also you received and in which you stand. 
by which you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received. And now who did he receive it from? Paul was taught directly by Jesus. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised when? On the third day according to the scriptures. What does scripture say? The sign of Jonah. The only sign I'm going to give you that I am who I am is the sign of Jonah. As he was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And that year, the Passover was on Wednesday. He was put in the grave at the end of Wednesday. Had taken his body down about five o'clock, died at three. Joseph of Arimathea had to go and ask for his body. They gave him permission the next day as the first at sundown would begin the first holy day of the year, the first day of unleavened bread. You can go back to Leviticus 20, 23 and see that clearly. That the Passover's 14th day of the first month on the Hebrew calendar, the first day of unleavened bread, which is a holy day, is the 15th. So it's the next day. It begins at the end of the Passover, which ends at sundown. So by the time he got the Body of Christ, Joseph of Arimathea, got it. He was probably about five o'clock. Had to get that by spring. So, you know, you, your, your days are not long yet. They put him in that tomb. At the end of that day, the end of the Passover, right before the first day of unleavened bread, we find in the Gospel of John that that day was a high day. It tells you that it was an annual Sabbath that can happen on any day of the week. That, we, that time it was Thursday. So it was in the grave from uh, Wednesday night at sundown to Thursday night at sundown. That's one day. From Thursday night at sundown to Friday night at sundown is two days. From Friday night at sundown to Saturday at sundown or just before sundown because he was put in before sundown. It's three days and three nights. And that's when he was resurrected. If he was in there one more night, that's three days and four nights. He was in there three days and three nights. And Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still dark and the tomb was already empty. It was empty because he was risen on the, at the end of the Sabbath the day before. Because that would fulfill the sign of Jonah and the only sign that he would give. That is a part and an essential part of the gospel. If that is veiled, who is veiling it? If it's replaced by a gospel of a Friday crucifixion and a Sunday morning resurrection, a day and a half, who did it? Whose fingerprints is on that? Is it true? If it is true, then Jesus is not the Messiah. But he is true. It is, he is the Messiah. So that's not true. And why, is there, why was there such an effort to hide that? Why is there such an effort to replace the truth? Why would the devil seek to do that? You see, we may not even understand all that, but it's significant. It's significant. It's not an accident. Oh, he targeted that. Because he knew he could get to the heart of the gospel. The spear point of the gospel is that Jesus was risen on the third day, just before the fourth day, because his body would suffer decay on the fourth day. And David said in Psalm chapter 22 that he would not suffer decay. So now notice. So that's the gospel. This is what he says. I'll make known to you, brethren, the gospel that I preach, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he died for our sins, and then he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and he appeared to many people. And then he says, if there is no resurrection, then Christ has not been raised, verse, verse 13 and 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Our faith also is in vain. See, he said, it all begins with this. It begins with this. 
There is no power for forgiveness of sins if Jesus could not conquer the grave. If he, did, if he could not show that he had an incorruptible, indestructible life, well, then we have no hope. We are to be pitied above, above all men. Then he goes on to say that in Adam all, all die. And we do die. Now listen, there's no need to die. And these preachers out these funerals will just say, you know, just going on. Just going on. Just floated right out. Went right on. Well, the spirit of man goes back to God. The spirit of man goes back to God. I think there could be some momentary consciousness there when the spirit of man goes back to God who gave us life. It's the life that he breathed into us in the spirit of man. There could be some consciousness there, but it doesn't stay, obviously, because the Bible says there is no thought. There is no consciousness in death. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. See, this, this shows the need for Christ, the value of Christ. If you think you're already immortal, that you're an al already a, an immortal a soul living in a fleshly body, why do you need the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You don't. Why is it that you need to die with him in order to be raised with him? You're already raised. You never went anywhere. You just floated off somewhere, floated off to heaven somewhere or purgatory, wherever you go. You know, that's not true. Amen. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits after that, those who are Christ at his coming. Now, let's go over to uh, verse 42. So also is a resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. That's why Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. So also it is written, the first man became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Where do we get our life from? We get our life from Jesus. If we already have eternal life, we don't need the gift of eternal life. We just need forgiveness, that's all. We don't need a resurrection. There's no need for that. There wouldn't even be any need for Christ to have been resurrected in bodily form. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, he's earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so are all, are all those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We are perishable without Christ. Now you are not perishable because you have received Christ. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, notice, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, O death, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now let's go over to Genesis chapter 3. So Christ, crucified on the third day, resurrected, I mean, on the third day, is the spearhead. It's the spear point of the gospel. It's what makes everything else work. Now, the first lie, of course, to Eve was, you shall not surely die. Well, let's look at that. Verse 3, 19 you know, he told her you won't die. But here in 19, at the second, the last part of verse 19, chapter 3 says, you are dust and to dust you shall return. He tells them right there what they are. They're dust. Now, do they have the breath of life in them? Of course. God breathed the breath of life in them. Do they have the spirit of man? Of course. 
But even say, saying that, God says, you're dust, and you're going to return to dust. Verse 22. Then the Lord said, behold, the man has become like one of us. He knows good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So what does that tell us? That tells us right now they're dust and they cannot live forever. But if they eat of the tree of life, they can live forever. I don't think this would be a one-time thing. I think because we see that even, you know, in the world to come, that, that the tree of life will be there and people will eat of it. So people will have to eat of it. Therefore, the Lord God sent him, sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which it was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So they did not obviously have life in them, except for natural mortal life. There was no eternal life. Now let's go to Psalm 146. And I realize that most of you know these things already, but there'll be people that are watching and we'll see later. And uh, it's a good refresher for us anyway. 146, Psalm 146, verse 1, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord while I live. I will sing praises to my God while I am be- I have being. Do not trust in princes or in mortal man in whom there is so no salvation. His soul departs, he returns to the earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. And that's the way it is. But it's not that way in Christ Jesus, amen? Because we have the hope of the resurrection. And again, I remind you of what we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that this mortal must put on immortality. Now let's go over to Romans for our final scriptures, verses here. Romans chapter 2 to begin with. Romans chapter 2. And let us keep in mind that The goal of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the defeat of death. You know, I mean, think about it. God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of the forbidden tree. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because if you eat of that tree, you're going to die. You're going to die if you eat of that tree. Death will come into the family of man if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, that obviously tells us that God never had any intention for man to die. Matter of fact, he tells us that he has put eternity in our hearts. It's, death is foreign to us. We hate death. Uh, it's foreign to us. We're, re, we're repulsed. It repels us. It repulses us. You know, we don't like it at all. Uh, and we were never created to die. I mean, that wasn't the intention, even though God knew. That's why Jesus was slain before the foundation of the earth. But if there had been another way, he would have been, did another way. Now, he, the fact that he is saying here that you will die if you eat of this implies that you would not die if you don't eat of it. And they had access also to other trees, but including the tree of life. Perhaps they were eating on the tree of life. Maybe that was what was keeping them alive. Maybe as long as they ate of the tree of life. You know, we don't know that they weren't eating of the tree of life. They may have been eating of the tree of life. The tree of life may have sustained their eternal life or their, that they would never die, that they would never taste death. Whereas... The others would just give them substance and strengthen their bodies and things like that. But maybe it's the tree of life that would keep those created bodies alive. I don't know. That's just something to think about. But, I mean, we've often thought that, you know, well, uh, it almost sounds like, well, they have been eating the tree of life. And, you know, when when he said we, we need to get them out, let's say eat of the tree of life. That doesn't mean that for the first time necessarily. It could just mean that they just keep eating of the tree of life, you know, and live forever. 
And I'm putting this with what we see in Revelation chapter 22, when you see that, you know, that people will be eating the tree of life in paradise that to, in order to live. But he said, you know, you, the day you eat of that, you will die. So death came into the human family. And because since then, as we see, especially in Romans, that all men died. All men have all died. Everyone born in the likeness of Adam has suffered death. But, and as we see in Romans, that as in Adam all die, as in Christ, all will be made alive. And that we're, we saw that in uh, Revelation, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus, the second Adam, became a life-giving spirit. It's God's gift to give us eternal life. So God is what we lost through obedience was life with God. We were separated from God. People often just say that. Sin separates us from God. But what sin actually did, God didn't say, well, the day you eat of this, you'll be separated from me. What well, God said, the day you eat of this, you will die. You're, he didn't mean that day, but he just say, the day you eat of it, death is coming. You're going to die. And so, obviously, he cut, he, he was, they were cut off from God, too, in, in a way. I mean, they were removed from the garden, and they didn't have the same fellowship with God anymore. They didn't walk with him in the garden anymore. But the real enemy of God's plan was death. That's the enemy. Death is the enemy. And so death had to be defeated. And Jesus defeated death. God defeated death by becoming a man, by becoming a mortal man in our likeness, being, living a perfect life, being crucified, and death could not hold him, and he was resurrected. And we, all of us who receive him, are, we are buried with him, crucified with him, and we're risen with him, as we see in Romans chapter 6 very clearly. And that's wonderful theology, amen? And we will always be with the Lord, and he is in us, and we are in him. Now here in Romans chapter 2, notice verse 4. Or do you think kindly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of the stubbornness and, stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. Now notice, to those who... By perseverance in doing good, even when it's hard, even when you don't feel like it, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. Let me read it again. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That's what we seek. Life is to be restored in Christ Jesus. What was lost at the garden is restored. But to those who are selfish, selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation, that's what's going to come. But you see here, why do we do what we do? Why do we persevere in doing good? Why do we persevere in walking in the truth when it is difficult? Well, because we seek glory, honor, immortality and eternal life, which means we already don't have, outside of Christ, we don't have immortality. Outside of Christ, we don't have eternal life. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith and to the grace in which we stand and we exult in hope of the glory of God. In verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and much more than having been 
justified by his blood, now having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by what? By his life. Well, what life? The life before or after the resurrection? Well, the life after the resurrection. That was the story. He has risen. Jesus is alive. The grave could not hold him. Now, the significance of that is, is he told Martha and Mary, I am the resurrection. You'll see Lazarus again. I know at the judgment, he says, I am the resurrection. The resurrection is standing in front of you. Now, Jesus hadn't been resurrected yet, but the power of resurrection was going to be there, amen, because of his perfect life. And our final scripture here in verse 23 of chapter 6, notice for the wages of sin is death, and that started at the garden. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that is the covenant. The covenant ratified it by the blood of Jesus is it washes away our sins, it removes our sins from the memory of God, it causes us to be perfect in his sight, sinless in his sight. Jesus is ever at the right hand making intercession for us and we receive eternal life in the family of God. So the gospel is the power of salvation for all who believe and all who will walk in it. And the covenant of grace through faith ratified by the blood of Jesus in order that what was lost would be restored. Not only our fellowship with God, but life itself. Access to the tree of life. Amen. And we have it of course, in Jesus. And so the point is that we would inherit eternal life and be living as sons of the living God for him for all eternity. Amen? Would you close us in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, and your Sabbath day the freedom we have in this country to come together and not have to fear what man will try to do, but that we can just be at peace and lift you high and honor you with our obedience and our love. We ask your blessing upon this meal the rest of our afternoon, Lord, and bless those that couldn't be here. Just let your spirit pour out to them. In Jesus' name, amen.